And then my father looks at Norby and says, Norby, you know, where's my end? I'm your partner. When we formed this uh, agency, this management company, I was your partner. I've been your partner since way back when. And Norby looks at my father and he says, you know, Sonny, I, I don't quite remember it that way. He said, I remember, you know, I was having a relationship, but you weren't my partner. And I remember my dad looking at him and said, well, if I put a bullet through your head and that pastrami sandwich lands up along with your head all over the table, would that refresh your memory at all? Welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. It is now Tuesday, September 29th, I believe. Man, this month is flying by. Hope everybody again had a good weekend. A lot of great comments yesterday on the Ten Commandments of the Mafia. Glad you all enjoyed that. So uh, really appreciate it. Got a lot of nice comments and well wishes for my daughter, Amanda, who you know has got some health issues. We know she's going to be OK, but we appreciate the prayers. And really, thank you. So many of you have just wished us well. and and uh, praying for her, and we really appreciate that. That's what, you know, this uh, relationships are all about. So thanks a lot. What are we going to do today? You know, something that you may not be aware of, many of you out there, is that the role the mob played, Cosa Nostra in this country, in the music industry. And I can tell you it was a very significant role. We had a lot to do uh, with the growth of the music industry here in America. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to, a, a, you know, a story with my dad, you know, my dad used to take me when I was younger to a lot of places. He had a lot of different uh, business interests. He, um, he owned a couple of auto body shops, and that's where I first started working on cars in my dad's shop. Uh, he also had a tailor shop in, uh, in Brooklyn. You know, I didn't really enjoy visiting that with him, but it was a tailor shop. But the most exciting, the, the, the thing I enjoyed the most was visiting uh, my dad's record company. And when I say my dad's record company, he was a silent partner in it, but he certainly had a big, big interest in it. And uh, how did that come about? Well, I'm going to relay a story to you that was uh, relayed to me by a person by the name of Phil Steinberg, who is one of the founders of Kama Sutra Buddha Records. And um, he and his partners, Hi Mizrahi and uh, Neil Bogart um, and Artie Rip, they're all kids from Brooklyn, young kids. And they had a talent for music. And my father kind of liked them. He met them somehow, took a liking to them because they were kind of knock around kids. And he just liked them. Well, he used to go up and visit them. They had an office on 1650 Broadway in Manhattan. And he used to take me with him all the time. And this was in the early 60s, you know, late 50s, early 60s especially. <clears throat> and uh, Phil Steinberg related this story to me. He said one day um, he was in his office of Kama Sutra Buddha Records. And they represented a, a group called the Shangri-Las. I don't know if you remember them. You young kids may not, but those of you my age, Shangri-Las, remember Walking in the Sand. It was a big hit for the record company. It was their biggest hit, really, to start this independent label off. And um, Phil Steinberg was in his office, and he gets a visit from a person by the name of Morris Levy. Now, who is Morris Levy? He's somebody I'm going to spend a lot of time with because he was a major, major force in the record business back in the, in the early 60s, 70s, 80s, and he was totally mobbed up, had all mob relationships. And I'm gonna get into that because he deserves that much uh, time put into his story. And uh, so Mo, Mo Levy comes up and, and visits him. And just to give you a little background on Mo, uh, he at one time had copyrighted um, the phrase rock and roll. It was his phrase. And he ended up getting paid from major record companies to use the name rock and roll. And he did that for quite a while until the federal government stepped in and said, no, that's a generic term and you can't be shaking down uh, record companies to use that word. But that's the kind of you know, clout that he had early on in the business. He kind of created or patented the word rock and roll. So anyway, uh, Mo Levy happens to uh, come up and visit Phil Steinberg in his office. And uh, he congratulates him on the big hit that he had with the Shangri-Las. And he says to him, he says, uh, uh, by the way, uh, you owe me a cut of everything the Shangri-Las do, all the money that comes in, because I got an interest in that record, in that uh, artist, in those artists. And uh, Phil Steinberg says, well, I wasn't aware of that. 
but he knew of Mo Levy's uh, uh, connections. He knew he was all mobbed up. He was kind of a legend already at that point in time in the industry. And he wasn't about to argue with him, but he was upset. He's saying, look at this. You know, I just get started in this record company. I got a big hit. We put a lot of, into this, me and my partners, and I got somebody shaking me down. So Levy leaves the office that day and says, get back to me, you know, in a couple of days. I'm sure when you check me out, you're going to make the right decision. Steinberg immediately calls his partners in, Adi Rip, Hai Mizrahi, and I think Neil Bogart at the time, and he tells them of this problem. And obviously all these young kids are upset. They're young, they're 23, 25, 26, just got a major artist to group, you know, to have a big hit, and here they are, Mo Levy shaking them down for a cut of it. <clears throat> and just so happens, that day, my dad came up to visit them. And he went in the office and he saw what was going on, you know, and he, he said, hey, you guys, you're, you're looking kind of down. What's wrong? And they said, ah, you know, just a little bit depressed today. And he said, depressed? You guys should be sitting on top of the world. You got a big hit with this Shangri-La record. What's going on? So Phil Steinberg initially didn't really want to tell this to my dad because he knew who my dad was. And even though he liked him, he knows when you start to get a favor from a mob guy, well, there's more to it, more involvement. But anyway, my father's persistent. He says, hey, tell me what's wrong. So Phil Steinberg and the other guys, they let him know that Morris Levy came up there and that Marvis Levy is basically shaking him down for a cut in all the Shangri-La's royalties. My father said, really? He did that to you? He said, let me handle it. He said, I know Mo Levy pretty well. Mo Levy handles it. You know, I got to tell you, my father told me later on, he said, you know what, Mike? He says, I like Morris Levy. He says, it's too bad that I had to kill him. I had to put a contract on him at one time. Uh, but that didn't happen. He obviously spoke to Levy, who at the time was, uh, you know, was uh, connected with a guy by the name of Tommy Vastola. They called him Corky. He was a D, D. Cavalcanti soldier. He even got involved with the chin at one time. Uh, Tommy Eberle, who was the one-time boss of the Genovese family, was actually his partner in a label. He had a label called Roulette Records. And uh, my father spoke to him and put an end to that. And that was the end of Mo Levy's involvement with the Shangri-Las. As a result of all of this, my father became a partner in Kamasutra Kama Buddha Records. And uh, they went on to have a, a list of hits. I had some big artists. I don't know if, uh, again, my age, uh, you'll remember this, but you younger kids, you may not know it. 19, 1910 Fruit Gum Company, all those bubblegum uh, artists, uh, the Shangri-Las, of course, uh, Jay and the Americans cut a record there, the Isley Brothers, I believe, did, um, uh, who else, Jay and the Americans, a whole bunch of artists, so it turned out to be a big label. Buddha uh, went on to be a very successful company, and I got uh, involved myself with uh, Artie Rip and some of the other guys. Neil Borgott, you know, became a big, big guy in the record company, so, um, you know, initially, the mob had a lot to do. Now, you all know the name Norby Walters. That's been brought up a couple of times. Norby Walters goes way back with my father. And uh, initially, Norby uh, was partners with my dad. He had a club called the Norby Walters, very successful nightclub. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, it was close to the uh, Copacabana. People used to empty out of the Copa and they would go to the Norby Walters Club and lounge. Walt, and Norby had a brother named Walter Walters, Walter B. Walters. They used to run the place. My father had a silent interest in it. He used to bring people there. Very successful club. It lasted for a while, but then somebody got shot and killed in that place and they closed it down. But that kind of began the relationship uh, with Norby and my father. And they went on to be, according to my father, partners in another enterprise when Norby started to manage a lot of the top black talent, Dionne Warwick, Marvin Gaye, all the big black talent in the 60s, Norby was their uh, representative for all the tours, and he would book them. He was their, actually their booking artist, not really their manager. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'll never forget, there was a time when, uh, I'll never forget, Ma Marvin Gaye was, uh, came up to the office, and Norby used to manage his money, and Marvin asked him, he said, uh, you know, I need $5,000. And Norby didn't want to give it to him. He said, you know, Marvin, what are you going to do with the money? He knew Marvin had a drug problem, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, he gives him the $5,000. I said, Norby, it's his money. Give it to him. So he gives him the five grand. We're up in the office. I kid you not. About an hour later, Marvin comes up, and he's got boxes of shoes. And he tells Norby, I just blew the money. He bought $5,000 worth of shoes on his way to his car. I mean, that's, that's Marvin Gaye. Good guy, by the way. I liked him a lot. He was a very sincere kind of guy. Shame what happened to him. 
But Norby and my dad were partners in that. My dad goes off to prison. I would manage Norby during that time. I think some of you know, after the artist representation business, he got involved with uh, sports athletes um, and he was uh, uh, representing them for their contracts with the NFL and their endorsements and so on and so forth. That comes a little bit later. But there was a time when Corky Vastola, D. Cavalcanti, a uh, soldier, later a capo in that family, um, he was trying to do some business with Norby, and obviously Norby belonged to me, my dad, so that couldn't happen. I think Corky got a little bit upset about it. He went to Junior, my boss, Persico at the time, and told uh, uh, Junior that, hey, Norby continues to use um, uh, the Franzese name, but he's not paying his fair share. Anyway, he put in a real beef on, on Norby. Uh, Junior called me up. I went to see him. He said, hey, Mike, what's this deal with Norby? He's been using your guy's name. He's not paying up. Now, what he didn't know is that Norby was paying to my brother. My brother was going up there collecting the money off of Norby. My brother had a drug problem at the time. Who knows what he did with the money? It wasn't coming back to us, but I didn't care. I was making plenty of money. I used to just use Norby to have concert tickets. I used to be ringside all the time because he represented everybody. And I had a couple of clubs at that time. And Norby would bring me the top artists of the day to work on my club. I'd get them at the right price. So it was a good relationship. I didn't care about the money. I didn't need it at that point in time. But my father had a little different opinion. When he came home, he wanted to sit down with Norby. He came home from prison on one of his many paroles. And he said, set up a meeting with Norby. I want to talk to him. And I said, OK. So I set up a meeting with Norby and my father in the stage delicatessen in Manhattan. We're having lunch. My dad and I are sitting together. I was already, you know, my dad's acting captain at that time. Norby's sitting across from us. And we're having a nice conversation. And then my father looks at Norby and says, Norby, you know, where's my end? I'm your partner. When we formed this uh, agency, this management company, I was your partner. I've been your partner since way back when. And Norby looks at my father and he says, you know, Sonny, I, I don't quite remember it that way. He said, I remember, you know, I was having a relationship, but you weren't my partner. And I remember my dad looking at him and said, well, if I put a bullet through your head and that pastrami sandwich lands up along with your head all over the table, would that refresh your memory a little bit? And I got to tell you, Norby turned white at that point, <clears throat> and he was really upset. My father was upset. I mean, he was really scared. My father was upset. And I jumped in at that point in time because I like Norby. And I said, Dad, look, you know, I talked to Norby. I said, we got a new gig going. He's going to be paying up every week. Don't worry about it. He acknowledges the partnership. Am I right, Norby? Norby said yes. At that point, he was scared. And, and so we were able to leave that day. And my father said, don't let this guy get away with anything. I said, Dad, don't worry about it. He's OK. Well, you know, cut to, you know, what happened years later on. Uh, Norby was using my name, my father's name. He was shaking down professional athletes. I'm in prison. I get subpoenaed to, to go and testify in the trial because I had given him, you know, a bunch of money and he was using my name. And that turned out to be a whole fiasco. Norby did not go to jail for that. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details or why, but let's just say uh, that we knew what we were doing at that time. Norby never did a day in prison, but... You know, that was only part of the relationship that we had uh, in the music industry. That was my father's point. Now, I'm going to get into what Morris Levy, who was much more in depth. He was a hands on guy. Again, he was involved with the chin. He had a record label called Roulette Records. He had a, a chain of uh, record stores. And these record stores were called uh, Strawberry Records, I believe. I think there were 60, 70, 80 of them across the country at that point in time. He was extremely influential in the early days of the music business here in America. He dealt with all the record labels. Um, many of the heavyweights, they were afraid of him. They knew his involvement. He was a very outgoing kind of guy. He didn't hide who he was. Everybody knew the relationships that he had. Uh, and he made hundreds of millions of dollars in that industry had a big, big impact in it. So that's coming up next. Morris Levy, watch for it. I think you're going to enjoy it. And I think you need to understand, again, it's just another business that the mob was able to infiltrate here in America. One of the many, aside from the unions, aside from corporate America, aside from the, the gambling industry, aside from the money, uh, <clears throat> uh, the numbers business, we had a big influence in America uh, throughout the whole century, I would say, until the mid 80s when we know what happened at that point in time, things started to go a little bit haywire. So that's it for today. Look for Music Industry Part 2. We'll probably do that on Friday. It's going to be coming up. You're going to hear all about, all about Morris Levy, organized crimes involvement in the music industry. It was big. And uh, again, a lot of subscriptions. I think we're up to almost 190,000 in less than three months. 
And that's thanks to all of you enjoying the content. We really appreciate the support. Subscribe because then you get alerts. A lot of good interviews coming up. MichaelFrancis.com. The community is growing. We're way over 5,000 right now. The personal coaching, the life coaching, business coaching, it's really growing and I appreciate that. And I think a lot of people are benefiting by it. So that's it. Stay safe, stay healthy. God bless. See you next time.